are some announcements about talks in the next week or soon after. On the 15th of January at 3 p.m., there's a public lecture in the Indian Transition Series by Professor Deepankar Gupta, and the title is From Factor Producerist to Civic Consumerist, Contemporary Trends in Indian Politics and Society. On the, from the, 16, on the 16th and 17th of January, there's a conference uh, on Motilal Nehru and his times in association with Professor Neera Chandu, who's a fellow at uh, Tinmurti, and Dr. Anirudh Deshpande, University of Delhi. Um, there's details of the speakers, which you can look at later if you want to. On the 20th of January, there are two events. One is a public lecture in the Samaj or Itihas series by Dr. Siraj Vazi of Gorakhpur University on Jalvayu Parivartan Ka Mujhulish, Shehrong Par Prabhav, Karan or Nivaran. I call my English. Hindi is terrible, sorry. Uh, again, on the 20th of January, there is um, Dr. Sabrina Marchetti uh, of the European University Institute of Italy conducting a seminar on paid domestic work and post-coloniality, the perspective of Eritrean and Afro-Surinamese, Surinamese, I beg your pardon, um, migrant women to Italy and the Netherlands. There's a lot more, but if I start reading them, we'll never have time for Prashant. <laughs> so not that would be such a bad idea. <laughs> no. May I just uh, yeah. go through my little yeah. intro? <laughs> um, this is the first of our series of monthly talks uh, on cities in history. I think they're all in Indian cities. Um, our speaker who's starting off the series is Dr. Prashant Kidambi, who many of you will know. He's a homegrown JNU boy who now holds an extremely important academic position in England. Dr. Kidambi's doctorate at Oxford was on Colonial Bombay, on which he's published articles in journals and edited collections, and on which, uh, and in, sorry, 2007, a book, The Making of an Indian Metropolis, Colonial Governance and Public Culture in Bombay, 1890 to 1920. Dr. Kidambi's research interests include the social history of cricket in India. He's com currently completing a book on the history of the first Indian uh, cricket tour of Great Britain in 1911, which he calls an intriguing story peopled by an improbable cast of princes, Parsis, and plebeians. Um, if you'll allow this levity, um, Prashant, it reminds me of potatoes, prunes, and prisms in Little Dorrit. <laughs> the lovely alliteration. Uh, that casts interesting light on the interplay between sport, nation, and empire. We wait eagerly. I think to me what is more special about Prashant is that he is, at present, director of the Center for Urban History at the University of Leicester. This center owes its existence to one man's initiative. Prashant has stepped into the seven-league boots of H.J. Dios, who, after his research on London slums, was given a position at Leicester when his personal chair became an institutionalized one for urban history, and he created the Center for Urban History. I became aware of its existence long before Prashant was born, I think, uh, in 1967, when I was sent a modest, sacro-styled urban history newsletter, which they used to publish. From this has descended the very splendid journal, Urban History, which you'll find in the library, where Professor Janaki Nair represents India on the editorial board. H.J. Dios died tragically young at 57. Just before his death, he'd begun planning a conference to assess the strengths of and prospects for urban history. This conference was held later, after he passed away, in 1980. But what struck me as interesting was that it was in 1978, the year of his passing, that urban history got institutionalized in India. Um, I remember this very gleaming board in the Guru Nanak Dev University in Amritsar, which announced a center for urban history. And um, the seminar in February 1978 when Professor Greval brought together individuals from various disciplines, archaeology, geography, demography, history, for the first conference in urban history. It was presided over by uh, Professor Nurul Hassan, 
I'm afraid we thought that he had dozed through the three days of the conference, but he opened his eyes at the end and gave the most brilliant summary of the proceedings that I've ever heard. It sounded so good that we felt good, and we decided to make ourselves into a permanent fixture. Thus was born the Urban History Group, and uh, later registered as the Urban History Association of India. With um, the superb stewardship of Hindu Banga, we had annual seminars, there were two big conferences in here in Tinmurti in 1987 and 1990. And looking back, all I can say is that perhaps it was a mistake to attach the Urban History Conference to the History Congress, the Annual History Congress, because uh, that meant that only historians attended it, whereas the first one had been interesting simply because it had people from so many disciplines. Anyway, it's wonderful that Tinmurti has now thought up the series and cities, and it begins appropriately enough, not with a case study of Bombay or whatever, but with larger issues. And I read from Prashant's abstract, if you would like to, uh, like me to. Recent years have seen an upsurge of int academic interest in the contemporary Indian city. The urban turn raises important questions about the relationship between post-colonial urbanism, studied largely by anthropologists, geographers, sociologists, and political scientists, and colonial urbanism, primarily the preserve of historical scholarship. This paper argues that recent writings on colonial urbanism have opened up possibilities for a more productive dialogue between the past and the present in the study of modern Indian cities. I'm sorry to have taken up so much time, Prashant, then over to you. Thank you very much, Narayani, for that uh, lovely, erudite, and uh, generous uh, uh, introduction. Um, and it is uh, a privilege, indeed, uh, to be uh, invited to give this uh, lecture and to be uh, included in such a distinguished uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be back uh, in a place uh, that holds many happy memories, uh, many long hours of research and uh, talk and chat and all the things that, that were part of my uh, graduate experience uh, here. And indeed, uh, which have been part of my experience as a researcher uh, in the years thereafter. Um, let me begin by saying that uh, this talk represents something of a departure for me. Like uh, most members of my trade, I'm most comfortable cultivating my own uh, patch of turf, research turf, uh, which happens to be uh, the history of uh, late 19th and early 20th century Bombay. Uh, but in this talk, however, I'm going to uh, stick my neck out and foray into a wider intellectual terrain. And no doubt, I shall live to regret some of my more reckless generalizations today. Um, the impetus uh, for this paper really derives from an essay that I wrote uh, for a recently published volume called the uh, Oxford Handbook of Cities in World History. Uh, edited by a, a colleague of mine, Peter Clark, uh, who's also once the uh, director for the Center for Urban History at Leicester, uh, where I'm based, as Narani said, at the moment. And uh, Peter invited me to participate in this project. His editorial brief was essentially to produce a general uh, analytical account of Indian cities and urbanization from the beginnings of British rule to the contemporary moment. And he offered me a very generous 7,000 words to do this in. Now, writing this essay required me to read not only the historical scholarship on Indian cities, but also the literature on, the growing literature, I should say, on contemporary Indian urbanism. So what follows today, then, are some reflections based on that reading uh, and I very much welcome your feedback on, on the uh, sort of things that I'm about to talk about. I should also point out that uh, while I was reasonably well acquainted with the historical scholarship on Indian urbanism, I was rather less familiar at the outset of this uh, exercise of writing this essay uh, with the writings on the contemporary Indian city, which has largely been... Um, as uh, my abstract noted, uh, the domain of anthropologists, demographers, geographers, sociologists, political scientists, uh, architects, urban planners, and so on. 
Now, reading the substantial literature on the contemporary Indian city, what struck me principally is that the rapid changes that it is undergoing are regarded by many as a profound break or a rupture with the past. And this is so in two ways. First, at an empirical level, scholars have documented the dramatic and in some ways unprecedented nature of the economic, uh, social and cultural transformation of Indian cities uh, since the early 1990s. And I'll just come to this uh, uh, in a moment. But secondly, at a conceptual level, it has been suggested that the very uh, interest in the contemporary urban question marks a stark departure from the past in that prior to this, cities were not, subject, not the object of sustained and systematic intellectual scrutiny. Two well-known essays, uh, widely cited, uh, and both published a decade ago, one by Gyan Prakash called The Urban Turn, which appeared um, in the Sarai Reader of uh, 2002, uh, and the other by Partha Chatterjee, entitled Are Indian Cities Becoming Bourgeois at Last, have explicitly argued for the novelty of the current intellectual interest in the contemporary urban question in India. Now, what's interesting is for both writers, this neglect of the city is integrally linked to the ambivalence uh, or the supposed ambivalence that Indian nationalism manifested towards the modern city. In their view, nationalist discourse saw the village as the repository of the real India, the site where uh, authentic Indian values were to be found. And of course, this is where one went looking for the real India, and, and the whole nationalist project is assumed to be uh, the remaking of this real India, the, the discovery and the, uh, and the remaking of this India, which is to be found in the villages. The modern city, on the other hand, uh, was regarded uh, as the site of imposed cultural values and a space thereby rendered inauthentic by the technologies and practices of Western modern modernity. So the, West, uh, the, the modern Indian city is regarded uh, as being corrupted simply uh, by the fact that it's something that is created or seen to be created largely by uh, the technologies and practices of Western modernity. Now, both writers also argue that in the last two decades, uh, Ruling attitudes to the Indian city and uh, the attendant intellectual consequences of that have been transformed and that it has now become an important object of discourse and practice. For Chatterjee, this has to do with new ideas of the global city that have found purchase amongst the Indian middle classes. For Prakash, uh, following Thomas Blomhansen's work uh, on Bombay, but his wider theoretical reflections too, I, I think, uh, the new focus on the city um, is integrally linked to processes of vernacular, what he calls vernacular modernity, uh, that have un unleashed new forces that challenge uh, historicist visions of the city as authentic nationalist space. And the rise of new claims on the spaces of the city by plebeian groups hitherto marginalized by elite political culture and its practices. Now, in my view, these arguments raise important questions for historians of the urban past. If indeed the contemporary urban moment in India marks such a profound break with the past, what are its implications for the study of the present, of the past rather? And how should historians of urban India respond to the large body of scholarship on the contemporary urban moment in India that has emerged in recent years? Uh, and this essentially is, is what I'm trying to reflect on in this paper. Now, one way in which historians have tried in recent times to respond to these questions and these issues and these challenges is to emphasize the lines of continuity between the present and the past, or the past and the present. Uh, this, for instance, is what uh, my colleagues Doug Haynes and Nikhil Rao have tried to do in a recent paper uh, that looks at the significance of the period from the 1920s uh, to the 1970s as a particular uh, urban moment uh, or, or a period that is of significance uh, as, uh, in terms of its, uh, the consequences for urbanization in India. And in this paper, they try to challenge the view that the city in colonial India was an undifferentiated and static category uh, by precisely emphasizing its dynamic and changing character. So, for example, they would argue that the city in the 1890s is not the same as the city in the 1920s, and the city in the 1950s is, again, very different from what you have uh, uh, before. And that one needs to uh, you know, look at the processes at work, and that 
while this might have been done by, uh, by political historians, this is not, uh, you know, the social and economic processes that were transforming cities uh, have not really been studied. So they look at various aspects like suburbanization, they look at uh, the economic changes at work, they look, try to relate demography uh, and, and the politics of planning uh, uh, in their analysis. So it, the attempt is to argue that between 1920s and 1970s significant changes are happening and that allows one to link what goes on in the colonial city with what's going on uh, with regard to the contemporary urban moment. It's, it's a very good piece, and, and, and uh, in case you haven't read it, uh, I think it's a very suggestive uh, analysis that you find there. Uh, I do have some issues with it, uh, largely because central to their argument is the idea that colonialism becomes less important as an analytical frame post-1920s. Uh, and I think, you know, that's an arguable point. Uh, it depends on what precisely one is looking at amongst these different factors. I'm not entirely convinced about that, but that's something that, that, that's a debate for another day, as it were. But in what follows, I take a different approach in seeking to relate the present and the past. And in particular, I seek to query the assumption of a radical rupture between the urban past and the present not by emphasizing continuity or change, but by underscoring the need to explore relationships of affinity um, and alterity. In other words, one could argue that the search for continuity assumes that the object of inquiry is propelled by a telos that governs its evolution over time, and this has its own attended problems. There's my approach, uh, and when I say approach, it's, it's, it's a line of argument that I'm trying to develop, is trying to relate the present to the past by grasping affinities so that specific conjunctures and configurations in the past become instant, instantaneously contemporaneous while simultaneously being cognizant of historical difference. So it's, in other words, you can grasp in a moment the 1890s might suddenly become very contemporaneous to us if one is thinking of it, say, the politics of sanitation and health, which become very important in, in urban restructuring. And I'll just come to that uh, as I go on. So in order to do this, what I'm going to do today is to interrogate some of the framing assumptions about the past that underpin accounts of the contemporary urban moment. In particular, I suggest that the arguments about the radical I suggest that the arguments about the radical rupture represented by the present urban moment in India rest on overdrawn co contrasts with the colonial and immediate post-colonial periods. Indeed, perspectives on the contemporary Indian city seem to derive much of their force from a rather flattened and simplified notion of the urban past, especially in the colonial period. The present-day Indian city is regarded as a turbulent, crisis-ridden space, and the contrast here, implicit or explicit, depending on who one reads, is with an earlier period, an earlier era when the city was a relatively sedate entity, dominated by orderly spatial protocols and practices, and articulated by colonial elites and internalized passively and rather unquestioningly by Indians of different classes. So what I want to do essentially is to unsettle this binary opposition between the present and the past in the terms that I suggested. And I try to do this in two ways. First, I try to suggest that the contemporary framing of the urban question and the construction of the modern Indian city as an object of inquiry is one way in which we can try and explore interesting parallels and differences with the colonial and immediate post-colonial periods, post-independence periods. And second, I draw out some of the ways in which recent reappraisal, reappraisals of colonial urbanism have yielded important analytical insights about the workings of space, power, and identities that underscore the contemporaneity of the urban past, even while alerting us to its differences with the present. I should uh, mention at this point that uh, there will be some re visual relief uh, in the form of illustrations. Uh, the point of this is merely to evoke rather than to uh, sort of deepen my analysis. And I have bunged them in there because you might find the pain of my exposition becomes unendurable at some point. So if you want some relief, that's there for you to stare at and not look at me. Um, okay, so let me just start by focusing on the contemporary moment, okay? This, the, the, this, um, the literature that I said I'd been reading, which is all about, you know, uh, what's going on, what's going on today. Uh, 
Now, it seems to me that the contemporary discourse about the urban question in India is framed within a narrative of crisis. Scholars and writers of different intellectual persuasions uh, writing about present-day Indian cities uh, concur that present day, uh, that these cities are confronting challenges that are quite unprecedented in their scale, scope, and significance. Uh, and I think in the existing literature, one can identify four different aspects to this contemporary urban crisis, as, as scholars seem to be seeing them. Um, and these are, in short order, demography, deregulation, deindustrialization, and democracy. And I'll quickly consider each of these in turn. So let's take the question of demography. A lot of the literature on cities focuses on demography, the numbers, uh, question of numbers. And from one perspective, at least, the roots of the contemporary urban crisis in India stem from the overwhelming facts of demography. We're all now familiar by now with the ap apocalyptic scenarios that are constantly being projected about the size of the future Indian urban population, or indeed the size of the current Indian urban population. For, in, for instance, it is estimated by the, that by the end of the uh, middle of the current decade, the region will uh, account for five of the world's uh, dozen largest urban agglomerations. There's also, uh, there are also United States, uh, Nations reports which suggest that there may well be over 800 million South Asians living in towns and uh, cities by 2030. And, and one finds these sorts of projections in different kinds of studies. The numbers vary depending on the uh, demographic imagination at work. Uh, but, but the message is clear that we are heading for trouble because the sheer numbers are so staggering that they're going to overwhelm uh, Indian cities. Uh, and that these numbers are off the wall you know, compared to many other parts of the world, especially the developed world. So the, the sense that these uh, numbers are uh, staggering is even more starkly brought out. Now, of course, reckoned in terms of numbers, it is true that uh, the increase that we have experienced since the 1950s has been uh, enormous. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, in 1950, the urban population of South Asia, uh, which includes all the different countries of South Asia, was about 71 million um, out of a total population of about 454 million. By 2007, uh, according to one estimate, that urban population stood uh, at about 477 million and accounted for the entire population, uh, accounted for a third of the entire population in the subcontinent. And, and you can uh, disaggregate different elements of the uh, demographic analysis, look at the number of cities, you know, sort of 10 million plus cities, 1 million plus cities, and the rapid growth of uh, each category and so on. But what I'm interested here is the way in which the question of numbers has been mobilized within nar narratives of a demographic crisis within cities. And, and there the work seems largely to sort of emphasize an overwhelming tidal wave that has engulfed these cities. An uh, interesting aside here is that if one actually looks at the, uh, uh, the, the, the facts of urban growth over the period 1950 uh, to, 19, uh, you know, to the early uh, sort of the beginning of this decade, if it conducts a close analysis, it's not entirely clear that urbani urbanization in South Asia has followed a trajectory of rapid, unilinear, and uninterrupted growth since the 1950s. Indeed, the rate of urban growth has been marked by uh, discontinuities and periodic reversals on more than one occasion, sometimes caused by changes in the way the categories, of the, you know, the numbers were framed, uh, the, the, the categorization, at other times by a very real, uh, 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 the, you know, real process where the, the, the numbers didn't quite add up to the projections of, of, of those uh, who, who were projecting them. So, in a sense, you take the decade of the 1980s, uh, where the urban growth was less than what had initially been thought. So you have had those sorts of periodical reversals, but it does seem to be that, you know, the emphasis, the burden of the, uh, this uh, discourse seems to be very much on projecting the sense of a demographic crisis that is irreversible, uh, inelectable, and which is, is threatening to overwhelm many of these cities. A second kind of theme that emerges in the literature uh, on the current urban crisis has to do with the analysis of uh, the impact of policies of economic deregulation and the attendant uh, impact of uh, globalization and liberalization on the remaking of Indian cities. These changes are seen to have profoundly transformed 
the relationship between capital and labor, as well as had uh, uh, profound spatial ramifications within Indian cities. And of course, they are seen to have deepened the crises and the contradictions uh, within cities, triggering new conflicts. Related to this is also a literature, a strand of writing that draws attention to the consequences of deindustrialization and informalization of labor that has occurred within the classic centers of Indian industry uh, in, a, in an earlier era, in the, in the colonial period, for instance. Uh, places like Bombay, Calcutta, Kanpur, and so on. Uh, which have, uh, and this literature has shown uh, very effectively how the, uh, the industrial working class in these centers were decimated, how the urban centers themselves were transformed, uh, and the urban spaces that they had previously occupied have undergone, uh, undergone uh, profound transformations, become new gentrified sites dominated by elite residential properties, shopping malls, and so on. And finally, in one strand of the literature, the focus is very much on the consequences of democracy and how democra uh, democracy itself has unleashed new logics uh, which have transformed the way cities uh, now function and indeed the way in which claims uh, and, and conflicts within cities are both articulated and, and settled. Uh, and the whole idea that there's been a democratic revolution since the 1990s and the way people now um, uh, make claims to space uh, and the way in which, as a consequence, the urban landscape uh, has been uh, transformed. For some people, the city is now in, in, uh, is seen to be in a new post-nationalist phase where new claims to urban space, citizenship, and the material benefits of modernity have transformed cities into volatile sites of social contestation and conflict. Now, let me make clear, my task today and my aim today is not to assess the empirical validity of these perspectives that I've just very uh, briefly summarized uh, and presented a rather potted account of. What I'm interested in here is the framing of these developments within what one might call a narrative of crisis. And what that might mean in terms of the way we think of the relationship between the past and the present. Because here, I want to suggest, is an area where the past can indeed speak to the present. For narratives of crisis, in my view, have served to constitute the modern Indian city as an object of knowledge and governance at key moments in the colonial and immediate post-independence period. And at many of these junctures, there have actually been, uh, there's been an engagement in the way these discourses and practices have actually uh, helped uh, uh, have played a part in the remaking of cities at, at, at the junctures that, uh, that, uh, about which I shall be saying a little more in, in just a moment. But some caveats are in order before I proceed. The account that I'll present is chronological, but I'm not proposing a simple s a story of continuity from the colonial to the post-colonial period. Instead, what I'm going to try and do is to focus on specific conjunctures where this narrative of crisis reveals itself. And I'm also not trying to suggest that the principal elements and references within this narrative of crisis were the same across time. They were manifestly not. And finally, I want to say that what I'm going to be presenting is a potted account. It's schematic and selective in its treatment. And the aim is to uh, illustrate rather than be exhaustive. Of course, I cannot guarantee that you won't feel exhausted uh, by the end of my uh, talk. Uh, but that's another matter. Okay, so... Arguably, the first conjuncture when the notion of crisis was mobilized and deployed in relation to the modern Indian city uh, was the Great Uprising of 1857. As is well known, the iconic moments of the struggle between the British and their Indian opponents involved the siege of major cities and towns, Delhi, Lucknow, Kanpur, uh, you know the names. And these places, in a sense, acquired a metonymic quality within British discourse on the uprising in that they very mentioned conjured up uh, ideas of Indian perfidy and, and the justice of British retribution. Now, when the rebellion was finally put down, it also triggered an immense internal debate within the colonial establishment about the need to reorder these cities in order to prevent such outbreaks from happening, from happening ever again. In this instance, uh, the idea of crisis centered very much on the threat uh, of, to military security and the security of the British population at large, and the threat emanating from in the, Indian, the local Indian populations who needed then to be distanced uh, in order to, to, to counter this. Two classic urban histories, one by Narayani Gupta on Delhi and the other by Veena Oldenburg on Lucknow, uh, 
have told us in great deal about what in great detail about what then followed. In Delhi, the old order was savagely ripped apart and a new spatial sensibility imposed. This involved the demolition of vast parts of Mughal Delhi and the introduction of new modalities of spatial restructuring that reflected British imperatives of security and order. Similar impulses were also at work in Lucknow, as Oldenburg so ably demonstrated in her book. In both instances, urban reconstruction was underpinned by a narrative of crisis. And it is not, not just these two cities. We also have the examples of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the colonial states uh, building of cantonments uh, across the length and breadth of India in keeping with the new imperatives, both of maintaining a distance from the local population, but also with simultaneously registering their military presence in ways that would act as a deterrent to any future rebellions. We then come to the next conjuncture, and this happens uh, at the end of the 19th century, where the idea of crisis is again at play in the discourse about the Indian city. And this uh, happens in the context of the outbreak of the great uh, plague epidemic, the third great global pandemic, uh, which uh, came to uh, Bombay from Hong Kong and within months had spread to other parts of the Indian subcontinent. Over the next decade, this dreaded disease killed millions of people, many of whom lived in the cities and towns of the Raj. As I showed in my book uh, on the making of modern Bombay, the plague triggered the biggest crisis of authority for the British since the summer of 19 1857. And this is because the plague was explicitly seen as a, a, as a disease that might decimate, decimate the British population and the great anxieties and, uh, and, and sense of panic that it ha held in the British mind because of its associations um, uh, over time, uh, notably uh, the effect of the plague in Europe itself. Now, the plague was explicitly seen in the first instance as a disease of the uh, cities, uh, as a disease that, uh, that had developed in the city's poorer neighborhoods and that largely affected uh, those who lived uh, in these areas, largely the laboring population working close to the docks and the mills. And the poor were largely seen as the principal bearers of the disease, and hence it became important to, to focus on their habitats and, of course, the control and regulation of their bodies. It also triggered a major reappraisal of, uh, reappraisal of colonial urban policies. Even though Bombay's uh, had begun to industrialize rapidly in the late 19th century, the city's rulers had displayed a conspicuous indifference to its civic infrastructure out of the city, uh, outside the city's elite-dominated areas. The panic aroused by the plague forced colonial authorities to rethink this salutary neglect of the civic infrastructure in the city. And within the colonial establishment, of course, there were frantic debates about the crisis of sanitary order posed by the plague and the need, therefore, to remake the urban built environment in order for the city to continue to function. In this instance, then, the idea of crisis was primarily construed in terms of sanitary disorder and the threat posed to the health of the city's colonial elites by its poor. And one consequence of this is that the period from 1900 to 1914 sees a variety of initiatives uh, which seek to press ahead with urban schemes to restore sanitary order, and, and, and one way you could see this is the proceedings of the All India Sanitary Conferences that take place uh, in the first decade of the, uh, of the 20th century and, 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 and subsequently. And they have very interesting debates about how the colonial establishment has to take this threat seriously and how, as a consequence, you begin to see urban improvement schemes and so on being pressed into service in different cities. Bombay, of course, had its own uh, first urban improvement trust set up uh, in, in the late uh, 1890s, in 1898, to be precise. I now want to move forward to the 1930s, where again one sees a new conjuncture in which, again, the idea of crisis frames the discursive construction of the modern Indian cities uh, and has implications for urban policies. Now, several factors were at play in this particular conjuncture. One was the economic depression in the early 1930s, which produced a severe crisis in the countryside as a result of a falling agricultural prices, a growing scarcity of credit on account of the withdrawal of capital by British managing agencies, and the deflationary policies pursued by the colonial state. As capital began to flow towards the town, 
Labor followed suit, pers pursuing prospects of wage employment in the increasingly diversified economies of the larger towns and cities. And the total population of British India, for instance, grew by 15% in the 1930s. Uh, while the total population of British India grew by 15% in the 1930s, its urban population had grew, uh, grew at more than twice that rate. What's interesting about this particular conjuncture, to my mind, is that it centered largely, seems to have centered largely around the specter of labor in the city. Moreover, unlike earlier instances where the poor might have been seen as an object of, of fear or a threat on account of uh, the, 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 the question of uh, sanit uh, you know, their sanitary practices and, and the, the, the fears about the plague. In this instance, the, the, the discourse is much more political. It's about the challenge posed to the uh, city by the presence of the poor as a political force. Uh, and this is a period when you see the involvement, as Nandini Gupta has shown, uh, the poor get drawn into uh, uh, you know, resisting uh, uh, capital. They get drawn into uh, conflicts of a more sectarian kind, the, the rise of communal uh, tensions in uh, cities, including places like Bombay, which had hitherto not had this sort, these sorts of tensions. In the 1930s, you repeatedly see this alternation between uh, working class strikes and communal riots. But the, the, the presence of the poor, as, as, as the presence of labor as a political force uh, in this period lends a distinctive uh, uh, quality to the discourse on this particular urban crisis. And the crisis is largely apprehended as a, as a, you know, in terms of the problem of labor, what to do with it, how to discipline it, how to control it. And what's interesting is that in this period, the, this sort of discourse did not simply occur among colonial authorities. Property Indians entering the realm of municipal politics in larger numbers, social reformers, as well as practitioners of the emergent social science disciplines also began to take an interest in the labor question, some of them explicitly in tandem with the state, others in, uh, in critiquing it and arguing for different kinds of urban policies. Uh, and in terms of social reformers, it's very interesting. You get people like, say, Clifford Mansart, who, uh, who goes on to found the uh, uh, you know, Dorabji Tata uh, Institute for Social Work, who in the 1920s and 30s is working, uh, is looking at what's going on in the, in, in the neighborhoods of Bombay. You've got organizations like the Social Service League. I talk largely about Bombay because that's the city I'm most familiar with, but I suspect similar things are also happening in other cities. Uh, and that would make for interesting comparative analysis too. He then moved to the 1950s, and again, the idea of crisis around the city is 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 uh, is something that is very apparent. And of course, in this case, the conjuncture is different from from the 1930s. First of all. You have the partition of India and the resulting challenge uh, that, that uh, is posed by the resettlement of refugees in the major urban centers, but also in some of the uh, urban settlements that had to be created in order to cope with, with this uh, issue. But you also have a second element which emerges at this point in time, and which is the publication of the census figures for 1951, which drew attention to the dramatic growth of the urban population in the previous decade. The last decade of colonial rule intensified the rate of urbanization as waves of migrants fl flooded into the cities, and there was a net increase in the urban population of 18.3 million between 1941 and 1951, a figure that equaled the entire net increase over the uh, decades spanning the, uh, four period, uh, uh, the 40 years from 1901 to 1941. In this particular conjuncture and, and the narratives of urban crisis that, that one sees, there seems to be, to my mind, and this is a, a more speculative thought that I throw out, it is not something that I fully work through, uh, it needs further scrutiny, but it seems to me that uh, an earlier discourse of the threat of security and urban order recedes, it doesn't disappear, but it recedes, to be replaced by a new concern with numbers, the question of demography, demographic change, and you begin to see in this period interesting projections about what the future Indian population, urban population might look like. And if you look at articles, say, in, you know, um, by geographers and demographers in the late 1950s and the late 1960s, uh, in the early 1960s, this demographic imagination 
being at work can very clearly be seen. Uh, I came across an article by Kingsley Davis in a volume uh, that was published in 1962, uh, Predicting India's Urban Future. It was, the volume is called India's Urban Future. Now, Davis, uh, in this analysis, thinks about various scenarios of what the future Indian population might be. And for the period between 1970 and 2000, his projections, are, the higher end projections are as follows. Delhi in 2000, he thinks, would be about 66 million. Bombay, 33 million. Uh, Madras, 22 million. Bangalore, 16.5 million. Ahmedabad, 13 million. Hyderabad, 11 million. Now, you could argue that, you know, with some things, well, clearly the Delhi figures are, are, are way off, but the point here is how in this period you begin to start getting this idea about the importance of numbers uh, in a new way. And this is happening uh, at the conjunction both of the work being carried out by, say, research programs carried out under the aegis of the Planning Commission, the research, uh, uh, as well as bodies like UNESCO. And the urban literature of the 1950s and 60s, uh, the early 1960s, is full of these sorts of projections in all these sorts of studies about the question of numbers and, and, and what they might be. And this, I think, is a new departure. Uh, finally, we come to the period from the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s. And here again, this na narrative of urban crisis reappears in relation to the modern Indian city. What's interesting, of course, is that this crisis is not, not simply seen in terms of demography, but also a growing recognition of the failures of political economy and urban planning. In the 1950s, when demographers were talking about uh, the question of numbers, when geographers were talking about the question of numbers, there was also uh, a, an assumption that somehow social sciences could play a role in somehow addressing these urban problems, that these could be transcended, that cities, in a sense, were in a, a process of transition, as it were. Uh, but by the 1970s, by the late 1970s, mid to late 1970s, that earlier uh, optimism in the capacity of this kind of knowledge to actually transform the existing uh, situation seems to have increasingly been replaced by a larger pessimism about the, the way the Indian city has evolved. And much of this centers around a growing recognition of the failures of urban planning, the failures of political economy, um, and, and somehow the idea that things have not gone quite according to script and that these conflicts, in a sense, and, and the problems have become quite endemic and that they can't be uh, resolved. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that this is the only view. There, might, there were other contending views, too. But it's very interesting that you see this pessimism emerging, uh, in, in, you know, this pessimism in, in, a, in a lot of the discourse in, in this period. And, and you can see this uh, most interestingly in an article by uh, the urban sociologist Jason uh, on, on the unintended city, where he talks about how urban development uh, in cities has led to the exclusion of the poor. He talks about the ways in which notions of planning, notions of uh, 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 justice within the city, notions of equity have been systematically uh, undermined by the practices of elites and what this has meant in terms of the consequences for the lives of the poor and the kinds of practices they are then forging in relation to these exclusions. And for those of you who have not read this essay, it's very instructive to put this side by side with Chatterjee's piece on, uh, uh, on, on Indian cities, uh, you know, the, the, the essay that I cited earlier, because you see, a, a, in a sense, interesting kinds of parallels about, uh, of course, the theoretical frameworks are different and the arguments are different, but the concerns and the kinds of issues they're focusing on are not that dissimilar. So it's very interesting that, that you get this, these parallels, and obviously without suggesting that these are about the same things or that the framework is the same, it's very interesting that the kinds of uh, uh, objects of inquiry, the kinds of things that they focus on have these very interesting parallels and these very interesting resonances. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm, I'm, I'm running short of time here, uh, but I now want to turn to the second mode by which one can think uh, as historians of how one can relate the, the research of, of focus on the past with what's going on in terms of the contemporary urban moment, how to think about this relationship between the past and the present. It seems to me one reason for this disjuncture between the writings on the contemporary urban city and the colonial past is the way representations of the latter have worked to create a binary opposition between the two. 
Thus, if the contemporary city, as I said, is seen as a turbulent space marked by crisis and conflict, the colonial city is represented in rather, uh, as a rather static and sedate entity. Uh, and from this perspective, the colonial city is also largely seen as a creation of colonial elites, with Indians playing little or no part in its making. Indeed, according to Chatterjee, Indians, especially middle-class Indians, were not quite at home in the city because of their perceived lack of agency with its, with it, within its confines. Viewed thus, the colonial city appears as radically other to the contemporary Indian city, its settled features standing in stark contrast to the ferment of the present urban moment. But I want to suggest that in recent years, a growing body of work on colonial urbanism has begun to challenge this view. And in this part of my paper, I wish to draw out very quickly some of the key analytical and thematic perspectives emerging from this work, uh, which I think have implications with the way one might think of this larger question about the past and the present. My aim is to suggest that the current, cu the current rethinking of the colonial city opens up possibilities for a more productive dialogue between the past and the present. To this end, I'll focus on three key themes that have emerged within this literature, power, space, and identities, uh, and which I think offer interesting ways in which one might think of this relationship. Let me take the question of power first. Recent works on colonial power have departed from earlier perspectives that saw this as unified, purposive, monolithic, and omnipotent and instead emphasized ambivalence, uncertainty, contingency. Now, this is something that is not simply restricted to the uh, works on urban history, but within the uh, context of urban history, this has had very interesting implications because a lot of the new work on the colonial city stresses the internal contradictions, uh, constraints, conflicts, and competing interests and logics uh, that were operative within the colonial power structure. And they produced a critique of the univocality of colonial power. And one sees this in, in a number of the uh, works that have emerged in recent years. Just recently, I had the pleasure of reading a work on the making of Delhi by, uh, by a scholar called Raghav Kishore, who's based at SOAS, whose work looks, for example, at the remaking of Delhi in the period after 1857. And there's some really fascinating analysis and material here about how the remaking of the city was driven by competing logics, uh, uh, by internal contestations between different wings of the colonial, the emergent colonial apparatus in the city as it was seeking to consolidate itself. Um, in my own work on Bombay, uh, on the Bombay Improvement Trust, it became very apparent to me that the whole process of urban planning and urban development as it was carried out under the aegis of this, uh, of this body was driven with all kinds of internal contradictions uh, and, 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 uh, and, 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 and internal uh, conflicts. And the argument here then is not so much that, that, you know, that this hampers colonial power and makes it ineffective. On the contrary, what's interesting is the kinds of consequences and logics that flow from these unintended consequences which can be seen as immensely productive in their own right in order for colonial power to function in particular ways, in its desire especially to reshape urban spaces. Uh, and at the same time, you also see how the logics of colonial power, which at one level claim a certain kind of rationality, produce at another level particular kinds of arbitrariness which stem precisely from those very rationalities. And I think there's a resonance here for how in looking at how colonial power works for thinking about the ways in which uh, uh, colonial, uh, so post-colonial governance and indeed the way in which power functions today. Uh, and I think these insights from the colonial period have a contemporary relevance. If you look, for example, even at the way cityscapes and, and you know, everyday spaces in the city are scarred by the, comp the competition between uh, different departments within the same municipality as they, uh, as they go about their job, you can see that from an everyday level to more uh, uh, sort of more substantive levels, you find these sorts of internal tensions and conflicts operative even in the present. And here is one analytical frame in which one might think of these uh, of, of the way in which the past speaks to the present. Sticking with the theme of power, th there's also a second element which uh, the new literature has increasingly tended to emphasize. Actually, I should say, not entirely new, because the point I'm about to make is one that has emerged over, uh, over, over a much longer period of time than the, the more recent work that I'm talking about generally here. 
uh, and the point I'm making here is that the tendency of the colonial state for a variety of reasons to leave local autonomies intact uh, in the urban realm uh, in its practices of governance. So the modern regime of power in the colonial context in many cases did not displace uh, existing power structures. In fact, in many cases, it depended for its effectiveness on the extent to which it worked through and with these local autonomies, these, these local sources of power and influence. And this, again, um, leads to the buttressing of these sources of authority and power in ways uh, that, have had, uh, uh, that have important resonances for the way we conceive of what's going on today. Where, again, you see, if, for example, uh, with regard to planning, where different kinds of uh, perversions of the law can take place precisely because on the ground, different kinds of interest groups are entrenched in ways that often makes it, that are often subversive of the, uh, of, of the planning process. And that this has a logic, again, that is not somehow external, but it is intrinsic to the way power functions on the ground. And this, again, has important, uh, you know, in thinking about the colonial period when similar tendencies were at work. And in fact, created, one could argue, the kinds of uh, power structures or buttress the kinds of power structures whose influence uh, uh, endured long after colonial rule itself had gone. But even without taking that sort of continuous line, one could still argue that looking at the contemporary movement, there's very interesting uh, resonance that the past has for the present in the way power functions on the ground in, in many Indian cities. And I quickly want to make one further point about uh, the, the persistence of these local uh, sources of power and influence uh, in, in uh, urban arenas, that the only times when these seem to have been uh, sort of put in their place or when they, they were challenged uh, or sought to be displaced by the colonial rulers was at particular moments of crisis. The plague, for example, uh, uh, is a good example of, of a context in which uh, these sorts of local authorities had to be, in a sense, uh, dealt with if one wanted to implement, if the colonial state wanted its policies implemented. But the irony is that even in these instances of crisis, eventually the colonial authorities realized that their effectiveness depended on incorporating these groups into, their, uh, into the policies that they were seeking to effect on the ground, that without their support, things could not happen. And in many cases, the exception, these moments of crisis serve to underwrite the norm, serve to emphasize um, the authority of these, uh, local, authority, uh, these local leaders and, and these local uh, sources of power and influence in urban neighborhoods. I turn now quickly to the theme of space. And here again, recent work on colonial urbanism has questioned the notion of the colonial city as a starkly divided space based on relations of domination and dependence. And the argument here has been that this sort of idea of, of the colonial city as a completely starkly divided space has left little place for the role of Indian agency and Indian presence in the making of and shaping of colonial spaces. And the new works have questioned these uh, in important and interesting ways. They've questioned the idea uh, that, the, 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 that the divided city actually obtained on the ground. They argued instead that it was a discursive aspiration rather than being an established reality. Uh, and, and a good example here is Swati Chattopadhyay's uh, writings which show, for example, how on the ground itself uh, the, the lines between the native and the colonial were often blurred. But there have been other uh, works too in recent uh, years which have emphasized and deepened this point. There's been work, for example, about the presence of Indians in colonial spaces and the presence of pure, poorer Europeans uh, in Indian uh, uh, parts of many of these colonial cities. And of course, there's also been work now which shows how Indians contributed to the making of these seemingly colonial spaces through philanthropy, as well as the activities of particular Indian experts. I'm thinking here, for example, of Preeti Chopra's work on, on, on um, uh, engineers like, Marz, uh, like uh, the Parsi engineer Marzban in Bombay, who had an important role to play in designing and building many of the colonial buildings uh, in, in that city. But also the ways in which the Parsis, through their philanthropy, shaped many of the, the, the built structures of the city. A second way in which the theme of space uh, has also been retaught in recent years is that there's been a lot of work which suggests that colonial discourse itself, in terms of uh, um, colonial spatial practices, rather, 
were not as starkly divided along lines of colonizers and colonized. And some scholars have pointed out that these discourses and practices often drew a distinction between those who were regarded as being amenable to liberal, rational ideas and those who could be co-opted through discourses of improvement on the one hand and the vast irrational masses to whom this, was, this could only be applied, uh, to whom could be only applied biopolitical disciplinary techniques. With regard to the uh, specific urban practices uh, with regard to the, uh, the middle classes, for example, you have Will Glover's work on Lahore, which shows how ideas of improvement uh, uh, that lay behind the creation of the modern city of Lahore uh, incorporated Indians in interesting ways uh, using discourses of improvement uh, and, and incorporating them into particular spaces in the new Lahore that was designed that was distinct from the old city that was, of course, regarded as being beyond the pale and, uh, and ungovernable and unreformable. A similar uh, line of argument is also implicit in Nikhil Rao's recent book on the suburbs, the creation of suburbs in colonial Bombay, uh, where he shows how colonial authorities uh, uh, were responsible for creating these vast uh, suburbs uh, to the north of Bombay, which then came to be peopled by, uh, uh, by the lower and, uh, and, and middle classes, uh, and which are now, of course, quintessentially uh, you know, middle class Bombay. So in both these cases, you could see how colonial urban policies created spaces in which uh, Indians, particular classes of Indians, uh, were incorporated. And indeed, uh, those, these were spaces that these Indians came to make their own. On the other hand, when it came to uh, the urban poor, you have techniques of urban policing which, which seek to modify the everyday conduct of the poor. And you also have the discourses and practices around questions of sanitation, hygiene, a lot of which involves disciplining uh, the poor through particular practices, uh, either of segregation or the regulation of their bodies. And here one can see a very explicit class bias at work, and one that increasingly by the 1930s and 40s, as Nandini Gupta's work has shown, comes to be shaped, shared by uh, many propertied Indians, especially those who now increasingly come into the municipalities and who enunciate very similar views in relation to the urban poor. So thus viewed, the split between the two modalities of urban governance that emerged in the colonial period has significant affinities with the recent distinction that scholars like Chatterjee, for example, have drawn between uh, the two domains of what he regards as civil and political society. Uh, now, I have some uh, problems with Chatterjee's formulation, but I'm not going to get into that here. But my point here is more about exploring the, uh, the possibilities for a more productive dialogue between the past and the present by taking account of these new ways in which uh, themes like power and space have been rethought in the context of the colonial uh, city. And one interesting work that actually suggests how that dialogue might uh, forge ahead is Blom Hansen's work, of course, on Bombay in the 1950s and 60s, which uh, uh, which refers explicitly to the ways in which particular co colonial practices, particular practices of urban governance and, and, uh, and urban disciplinary techniques uh, can also, the resonances of those can be found uh, in a very different context uh, uh, in, in the Mumbai of the late 1990s. And finally, I want to also highlight the ways in which new work on colonial cities as sites for the fashioning of new forms of urban identity uh, are also, uh, offer us, also offer us a way of thinking productively about the relationship between the present and the past. And here, the most interesting work is the work that's been done along themes on uh, the, uh, the theme of citizenship and the theme of consumption. Uh, as far as citizenship goes, there's a growing body of work now that's interested in looking at how Indians in colonial cities began to articulate their urban identities through claims on the state for the provision, the, the material provisions of particular kinds of uh, services and goods, uh, which were very much connected with the aspirations of modernity in, this, uh, in, uh, in the early 20th century, and how that had significant consequences for the, uh, the, the struggles within the political struggles within the urban domain. And this, uh, as Sandeep Hazari Singh's work on Bombay, for example, for the early 20th century has shown, the city became a key terrain on which demands for citizenship rights, demands for greater inclusivity, and demands for better service and provision as far as the materialities of urban life were concerned, became increasingly important. And here, again, as I see, uh, as I see it, one can think of interesting ways in which these sorts of struggles can be related to the struggles of the present without adopting, as I say, a 
a simple model of continuity, but seeing the resonance of the past uh, uh, for the present. And consumption and, and, and the new practices of consumption that emerge within cities is an equally important theme. This is as yet an aspect of the new uh, historiography that is yet to develop fully, but it, it's something that is emergent. Uh, but I think it offers very interesting possibilities for the reframing of identities, urban identities, uh, with, again, as I say, resonances for the present, when we now see you know, uh, cities as sites of consumption with the shopping malls and so on. What's very interesting is that this literature is suggesting that as early as the 30s, uh, the uh, uh, practices of consumption and the discourses around them became very critical to the creation of new kinds of status hierarchies within cities and, and uh, arguments over consumption become very central to the making of urban identities themselves. And I think one of the interesting things that, that this literature suggests is that shifting the frame or widening the frame uh, to move from not simply capitalist industrialization, which was the focus of a lot of the labor history that had an urban focus in the 1970s and 80s, shifting the frame from capitalist industrialization to looking at capitalist modernity for some themes, not for all, for some themes, has important productive possibilities. Uh, I'm thinking here particularly of the kind of work that's been done by uh, Stephen Smith uh, uh, on comparing Russia and China in the early 20th century and using the optic of capitalist modernity, the, you know, the new conceptions of selfhood, the new discourses and practices and struggles around uh, material goods in the city, uh, the emergence of new forms of popular ent entertainment, the new forms of material goods that circulate within cities and how these become important in determining one's identity and one's status. These could be, th this could be a very interesting avenue in which one can think of the ways in which the, pres the, the present and the past can be made to speak to each other. So to just sum up, uh, what I've tried to suggest in this paper is that history has a major contribution to make uh, in, in enhancing and enriching our understanding of the contemporary urban moment with all its possibilities and its uh, problems. I've sought to do this in two ways. First, by exploring in the first part of the paper particular narratives of crisis emerging at particular conjunctures and the ways in which they serve to constitute the city both as an object of inquiry but also uh, as, as an object of governance. And second, I've tried to point to ways in the...